Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're two or three gathered together. He is here in the middle of us. He is here with us. Do you acknowledge that this morning? The Lord is here with us. Hallelujah. And I always love the buzz and the hum of God's people chatting and visiting and, and uh, getting together prior to service. But the Lord is here, and he wants to talk with us. He wants to minister to us. So we welcome him today. Hallelujah. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements, and I know I called the worship people up, but we're doing a, is that okay? But they can stay. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a baby dedication first thing, child dedication. So sorry about that, but you'll be nice and close anyway. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have the February calendar on the back table, and uh, so please pick one up on your way out. And uh, our Monday night baton service. If you were here, uh, we all read. A, a decree of the ecclesia of the church and then at the end of the service those who were present went and signed that decree so if you happen to leave before that signing the decree is out on the information table and Don will be there after service and you can sign that decree so so that you don't miss out on that we want to keep that uh, on hand here uh, as proof and uh, next Sunday morning will be our hymn sing. Pastor Murray and team are going to be uh, doing hymns for our senior people. Invite your friends. Invite those that love the hymns of the church, and uh, we'll share together. <coughs> February 7th will be a seniors' lunch and games. Don and Kathy are going to be serving lunch for our seniors, so that's on your calendar. Keep that in mind. Sign, there's a sign-up sheet for that. And I'd like to announce that our annual business meeting will be Sunday, February the 12th. And immediately following the service, there's going to be uh, pizza and salad for those who are going to be staying. And then we'll go right into our business meeting. That's on February the 12th. And the purpose of that meeting is to share our financial reports. And we're going to be electing two board members for a one-year term and a three-year term. Uh, the members have been advised of that, and uh, so that's the purpose of the meeting on February 12th. The Lord bless you. So now we'd like to invite Miriam and Daniel. They're going to uh, present Yana to the Lord this morning. Today is Yana's birthday and Daddy's birthday, Daniel's birthday. She was born on his birthday, so we just rejoice with them today. Daniel's got some family here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just stand, just face him. There you go. Hello, Grandma. Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Thank you, Jesus. It is my joy and privilege to, uh, I'm going to go like this. It's my joy and privilege. Then I can see everybody. They can see the whites of my eyes. It is my joy and privilege to introduce Yana. And just before we do that, I would like to open in a word of prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this place and space. Thank you. Thank you that we are in your presence. Thank you. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And thank you, Lord, for 
the invitation that you have afforded us all to enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We thank you for this occasion, this baby dedication. And we ask, Lord, that while we speak to these parents and grandmother, that you would indeed crown this time with your glory. In Jesus' name. It's my joy and privilege to be asked to dedicate this child. Yana, why don't you just kind of take a look over there, Daniel, so everyone can see. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. As many as you, uh, of you know, this is the daughter of Daniel and Miriam Brocky. They also have two children, Abby and Selah. I want to make it clear why we, why we are here during this service at this time. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. All of us deserve death, but Jesus paid the price for us all. We all benefit from receiving God's grace as we have invited him into our living, into our lives because of his amazing grace. We are all here. And so Daniel and Miriam have asked us to dedicate Yana. Daniel and Miriam have come today to pledge themselves before God and this congregation to raise Yana in a way that honors the Lord. And they will figure out how to do this. Not an easy task today, but they will best figure out how to do that. And as a congregation, we will help them. Yana doesn't know how things happen or what this is all about. This is one reason why, this is one reason why we do not baptize infants. In Mark chapter 10, there was a crowd around Jesus and he was teaching them as he usually did. On this occasion, there were some Pharisees there trying to find a place to trap him. And so they bring up the divorce question. And verse 6 says, God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. That's Mark chapter 10. What is interesting to me? You say, why do you mention that? Well, just a, a couple of verses later, the Bible says that later when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. And two, not just two verses later, I mean, they were just finishing having a discussion. And some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But you know what the disciples did? They scolded them. Now, why would they scold the parents? Well, they didn't want it. They didn't figure Jesus need to be bothered. I just wonder, I just wonder, Bible says that Jesus was upset or he was angry. Some one translation says he was angry with the disciples. I just wonder if those disciples have locked in their head that divorce thing. They were so fixed on that. They were trying to get the answer to the question. And there Jesus was. He wanted to bless the children. And these guys were so engaged in their activity and their questions and all that. that these children, just send them away. Get them out of here. Well, 
I wonder what they were thinking about. I wonder if this was what the, why they scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. It's almost like, don't bother him. We, we, we need him to answer our question. This big divisive question. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 14, it says, Jesus saw what was happening. He became angry with his disciples and he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. Glory to God. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter into it. They, well, he took the children in his arms and in some cases he placed his hands on their heads and the Bible says he blessed them. Hallelujah. These children were going to be Jesus' examples of how to receive the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? So friends, we do not believe in infant baptism. I do believe in dedicating parents so they can bring up their babies and their children in the Lord as Hannah did with Samuel. Let me say it like this. Dedicating a child to God is really a matter of dedicating the parents themselves to the Lord. Babies like Yana do not comprehend what is happening. So I'm going to ask these parents a question. In fact, I'm going to ask Grandma too. Daniel and Miriam, have you, and Debbie, Deborah, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been baptized in water? Well, do you today recognize that Yana is a gift and a blessing from God? Do you recognize that Yana belongs to the Lord? And that it was the Lord that gave her to you? Do you surrender all claims upon her life in the hope that Yana will one day commit her life wholly to the Lord. Do you promise that as parents, with God's help, you will bring Yana up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Do you promise to make every reasonable effort through the patience and love of God to build the word of God and the character of Christ and the joy of the Lord into your daughter? Do you promise to provide through God's blessing for the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs of your child, looking to your heavenly Father for wisdom, love, and strength as you serve him? Do you promise with God helping you that Yana will know for herself one day that she must come to Christ alone for the forgiveness of her sin and that you will teach her to know for herself the fulfillment of all God's promises, even the promise of eternal life and that for herself she must put her faith in Jesus and obey his teaching for herself. Let me give you some parenting tips. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says the Lord our God the Lord alone the Lord is our God the Lord alone and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your strength and you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today repeat them again and again to your children. Did you hear that? Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road. 
when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. In Psalm 78, it says, Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past stories that we have heard or known. Stories about our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of our Lord, about his power and his mighty acts. For he has issued them. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they will turn, they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Train a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from them. Place these tips before you always and act on them as the Spirit of God enables you to do them. One last question. Will you allow Holy Spirit to help you raise your child? I'd like everyone to stand, please. Together, do you think she'll come to me? Yay, yay. Yay, yay. Together with your parent, Jonah, who loves you dearly, and this people who care about the outcome of your faith, I dedicate or I present you to God in the hope that one day you will come to know God for yourself and that you will surrender yourself to God and that our God will become your God. In Jesus' name, we bless you. Now, Lord, I pray for these parents. Guide them, protect them, provide for them in the name of Jesus as they raise Jana to be a mighty woman. In Jesus' name. God bless you, dear. Now, uh, it should be easy to praise the Lord now. Eh? <laughs> Glory to God. Whether you sit or stand is not the issue, but praise the Lord and glorify the Lord and worship the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind in Jesus' name. And allow these young people to lead us. Amen. Morning. Let us worship the Lord today. Feel free to clap your hands and join us as we sing this song. And for this is the time to return the praises that belong to him. Amen. Let us worship the Lord.
Praise you, Lord. We magnify your name. Glory, glory to Jesus. Praise you, Lord. 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 We magnify your name. Glory to Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Almighty God, we praise you. We give thanks to you. In you we live and move and have our being. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, that led us into worship. That was wonderful. What great words to that song. You know, one thing about the moving of the Spirit of the Lord... Well, there's something about his presence that just, and not only feels good, but it seems good. Your whole being is taken up in his presence. On the other hand, what often happens is that we are also filled with questions. Or maybe it's just me. What are we supposed to do in the presence of God? How do we stay in the presence of God? Should I lift my hands? Should I clap? Should I be quiet? Or should I sing louder? When you talk about a relationship with the Lord, you know, the only manual we have is the Word of God. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Study this book of instruction continually. Everyone say continually. That does not mean once in a while. It means continually. Meditate it on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then you will, will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Now, is there anyone in here that does not want to succeed in all you do? Oh, I don't see any hands. Because everyone wants to succeed in what they do. Well, it says study. The book of instruction. If I was going to go to Manhattan, never been there in my life, I would want to get a map out or use 
my iPhone with Google Maps and have some instruction in how to get to Manhattan. Well, first of all, I have no desire to go to Manhattan. (laughs) So I'm not going to get my iPhone out to go there. But if I were, you know, you have an instruction manual how to get there. You know, uh, people talk about heaven. If I want to get to heaven, there is an instruction manual on how to get to heaven. If I want to draw closer to the Lord, we have an instruction manual that helps us to get closer to the Lord. Meditate on it. Day and night, you will be so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2 says, And they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves neither wither, and they prosper in all they do. 2 Timothy chapter 5 says in the NLT, says, work hard. King James says, be diligent. King James Version actually says, study. So that you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. You do not need the approval of men. But you do need the approval of Almighty God. Be a good worker and one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the Word of God. We know that there are all kinds of interpretations of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. (coughs) For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, and it exposes our inner thoughts and desires. That's what the Word of God does. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. And makes us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. And teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip. To prepare and equip his people for every good work. Now you might hear that last part. Prepared for every good work. And you might go, well, Pastor Ron, I want to know what the will of God is for my life. The will of God, when you read the book of Ephesians and Colossians, in summary, the will of God is not what you do. It's what you are. Because what you are Because of Holy Spirit in you, He will lead you into what you do. If Jesus did not do anything, but He heard His Father saying it, or He saw His Father doing it, He didn't do anything unless He heard and He saw. I believe as Christians, by the way, I'm going to say it again. Just because you go to church does not make you a Christian. Having a relationship with Almighty God makes you a Christian. You receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And what happens is when you uh, receive Him as Lord and Savior, you have someone called Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. Jesus said, 
I will never leave you alone. That's awesome. That's awesome. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's awesome. (laughs) And when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. That sounds just like the walk of Jesus. He hears and sees. He does not work on his own initiative. And you and I are to follow his example. People, as people trying to follow the Lord, we hear and we experience all kinds of things. And yet somehow we end up with more questions. Already this past week, those of you that experienced the baton passing are asking, what do we do now? Anybody have that question? What do we do now? We had a tremendous uh, Sunday with uh, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Ralph. What do we do now? Well, it seems simple, doesn't it? But I've had people ask me, what do we do now? Well, you know, questions are not out of the ordinary. In Acts chapter 1, when the apostles were with Jesus, the Bible says they kept asking him. Wow. Lord, has there come time for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? That's what their head was locked into. They were like horses with blinders. All they could see is Israel free and the restoration of the kingdom of God. So Jesus replies to them in Acts chapter 1. The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are, for, they are not for you to know. Dates and times. Wow. Does he stop there? You don't need to know when Israel's going to be free. And when the kingdom of God is going to be displayed. You don't need to know. You know what I'm learning about the the spirit of God? He tells me on a need to know basis. Is is it uh, comforting? My wife asks me all the time. About things that she sees that needs to be done. What about this? What about this? I don't give her very many answers. She's an administrator, and she likes to know things in advance. There are some things I cannot tell her. Well, the interesting thing, what was more important to Jesus? For giving the answers to the disciples, what was more important? For giving them the answers of the time and seasons? No, it wasn't his place to tell them. He does say this, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Glory to God. So, what was the focus of Jesus? Times and seasons? 
No, to be filled with the Spirit of God. You know, Matthew 24 tells us sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of money will grow cold. He says the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end comes. So, Matthew 13 tells us, and the, the, the questions come from the disciples all the time. In fact, I found it in three different places. When will these things be? When will be the sign of these things? What will be the sign of your return? They question him continually. When will these things be and what will be the sign? Well, you know, interestingly enough, Jesus, one day as he was leaving in Mark chapter 13, Jesus was leaving the temple that day and one of his disciples said, uh, look, look, teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. And Jesus says, I can just hear him. Yeah, look at these buildings. But they will be completely demolished. See, their sites were looking at buildings. Their sites were looking at the vastness and the size, thinking that this was a structure that was going to last. And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon the other. Peter and James and John and Andrew came to him privately and says, can you please tell us when these things will happen? What sign will show us what these things are about to be fulfilled? And the, you know what the very first thing Jesus says? Let it be a warning to us all. See to it that no one misleads you. That's what he says. Wow. During the 40 days that Jesus, after his resurrection actually, Jesus appeared to the, the apostles from time to time during the 40 days after he rose from the dead, proving to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He talked with them about the kingdom of God. And he was... He was saying to them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he's promised. I told you before, John baptized with water, but just in a few days, you'll be baptized with Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were, were with Jesus, they, again, they kept asking him. They kept asking him. Wow. Do you know what's interesting? Is sometimes Jesus himself will ask questions. You know, what do you do more than others? Jesus asked one day, why do you worry? One time he says, why are you fearful? Why do you think evil in your hearts? Do, do you believe that I am able to do this? Why did you doubt. Did you not understand? Who do people say that I am? Well, who touched me? Where is your faith? Why do you uh, let doubt in your hearts? Well, do you love me? What are you anxious about? One time he asked, who is, who is it that condemns you? Jesus asked questions not because he doesn't know the answer, but he often asked questions to show us what is in our hearts. He exposes to us what is in our hearts. Not for his sake, but for our sake. 
The heart is wicked, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Out of the heart flows the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I said to you the last, over the last couple of Sundays, God sees what we believe by what we do. Can you say that with me? God sees what we believe by what we do. So, what does that actually mean? There are some things we're not going to have all the answers to the questions that are asked. And it is going to um, be important for us to walk by faith. You know, I can read about running. I can be coached how to run. I can have the shoes to run. But if I have not put what I have learned to the test, I will never know what it is I can do. Yet we quote the verse, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. The Bible indicates to us, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Did you hear that? So in all of our questionings, no problem with the questionings. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to catch the word of faith. And that faith is going to have to bear witness. You know, faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the, listen to this, it gives us the assurance about the things we cannot see. So, you know, the old adage goes, seeing is believing. That does not work in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you know, blessed are, are those that believe, even though they do not see. So, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. I can see they're all excited about that. Father, open our eyes so that we'll see what you see. Open our ears so we will hear what you are speaking in Jesus' name. You see, in John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, it says he will guide you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in paths of righteousness, not for my sake, but for his name's sake. And even though we go through valleys of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why could he walk in the very shadows of evil and feel no evil? How many people have walked through these last few years afraid? And I'm telling you this, that when you are solid in the Lord, and your life is uh, founded on the rock Christ Jesus. Hell or high water, hurricanes or tornadoes, that house is going to stand because it's on a rock. But if it's built on sand, and that sand shifts and all that kind of stuff, and hail rages and winds come and hurricanes blow, that house will not stand. Your faith must be in the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his word. The Bible says that God watches over his word to perform it. Glory to God. He performs his word. When there's a miracle that takes place, he's, per he's performing his word. When a blind eye is open, he performs his word. When the deaf are here, he performs his word. When uh, there uh, is limbs that grow where there were no limbs, he's performing his word. Hallelujah. Don't throw away Hebrews 10.35. Don't throw away the confidence, the confident trust in the Lord. Be patient. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. A little bit later it says, and my righteous ones will live by faith. You may not know all the answers. It's on a need to no basis. At the point in time when you need it most, the Spirit of God will quicken the answer and then it'll be confirmed many times over. Romans chapter 1 says, The just shall live by faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. In the NLT it says, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong. And do everything with love. If you don't understand the answer to your question, be loving. When you're speaking the word of God, be loving. When you're walking out something, you, you, well, you just hear it from the Lord and you don't understand it. You still need to be loving. You say, well, pastor, how am I supposed to grow in my faith? Well, Colossians 2 says, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong. Glory to God. Your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. There's one scripture that says, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? It's quite a question. Disciples, they came to Jesus one day and they said, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. He says to them, this is, his, this is the answer to the question, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and you, it will obey you. Can you imagine? I am not a gardener. I don't plant trees. Most of the times, if I want a tree to move, I get somebody with a big deep shovel and to shovel around it and to dig it up. But this scripture says you need, I'm not to, I can see it now in the wintertime, people going out there by their house and trying to move a tree from here to there. I didn't want shade in that spot. Well, I'll tell you what. That mulberry tree or that mountain that is to go from here to there may be a happening in your life that needs to be moved. I'm not having 
somebody else come in and move the tree for me. The Bible says, you shall say to that tree or mountain, be taken from there and go to there. When you understand the scripture and when Holy Spirit begins to speak to you, when that thing is to be moved, you act upon what he has spoken to you. I don't know all the answers to the questions, but I do know this. The time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. They must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, do I have all the answers to how, what that looks like and you know, how to, I can just tell you personal experiences. I do know that the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for your growth and maintenance and uh, instruction of the how to go about your life. You know, in Jude chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith. And then it says, praying in the Spirit. When you don't know what to do, the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth and give you the actions that are necessary to get the job done. So, you're on your way to a tough situation. What happens is I'm building myself up in the most holy faith. I don't have all the answers, but he does. So I need some strength and some new power. I can't allow, I can't work on yesterday's anointing. In fact, the Bible says when you're being filled, it actually uses a term, be being filled. People make mistakes and just relying on one filling of the Spirit. The initial time when they come to Jesus and they, they start to speak in tongues, they figure that that's all there is. You see, no, it's not all there is. You need to be built up in the most holy faith. Glory to God. You say, well, my faith seems awful small. It's not even a mustard seed. Well, he Something begins to well up. There comes a well within me that springs to the life, a life I, I don't know in the natural, but I know in the spirit. So we pray. Paul says, I'm praying all the, all the time. He said one time, he says, I, I thank God I'm praying in the spirit more than you all. So, and then I share with people, it's necessary when you don't have all the answers and you don't know what to do when you're praying in the spirit. Why not ask them what it is you're praying so that you're praying with the understanding also. For that kind of praying, praying in the spirit is just not praying when you run out of English words or Filipino words or, you know, uh, Zimbabwe words. It doesn't matter what the language is. Some people think that that's what all the Holy Spirit is, is a fill-in when we don't know how. It's more than that. Glory to God. 
we're speaking things to God. He's, and he begins to share things with us. Glory to God. So like Paul the Apostle, praying with the understanding also. Many times, not all the time, but many times I'll be praying. And, and the Lord will clue me in as to what it is I'm praying for. Yeah. Yes, there are questions. Yes, I get that. Let me leave you with one more question. Who may worship in his sanctuary? And who may enter your presence on your holy hill? In Psalm 15, verse 1, those are the two questions that are asked. It says, the answer is, those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts, those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends, those who despise flagrant, flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts, those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Listen to what it says. Such people will stand firm forever. We come to the house of God and we dress the way that we dress. Some in street clothes, some in nice clothes, some in suits. God never saved your clothes. He died for those that are in the clothes. Holiness is not something you wear. It's something you are. Who shall ascend? Who can worship in your sanctuary? Who can enter your presence? Let me suggest this. That song the young people sang was a great invitational song of how we could come before the Lord and invite Him to move in our hearts. Let Him lead you and guide you. Let Him steer you in the right directions. Let your life be rooted and grounded and settled in him, you will, be, you will not be like uh, weeds blown about by every wind of doctrine. Because you are planting yourself in the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord abides forever. Now, Father, thank you for your word. The worship people can come. Father, thank you for your word. But even more, I ask, Lord, that you would instruct us in our living, in our rising up and our sitting down, and that the places where we go, we will bring honor and glory to none other than to you. I ask our hope is in you, O oh God. We, we declare our hope is in you. Our life is in you. Our strength is in you. But we wish for you to captivate our hearts, to speak to us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.